Kuma Media's Engineering News and Mining Weekly is interviewing Mike Pio, the Nedbank CIB Head of Infrastructure, Energy and Telecommunications, who earlier this year attended the Africa Energy Forum, which was attended by public sector politicians as well and public sector officials from across Africa. Hi, Mike. It's great to chat to you once again. Can you tell us about the event placing much emphasis on the need for Africa to remain green and clean when it comes to the generation of energy on the continent? Martin, thank you very much. So by way of background, the the African Energy Forum is a conference that has been held for probably the last 20 years. Um, It is probably the single biggest conference that brings together combination of public sectors, you mentioned politicians, regulators, project developers, project sponsors, bankers, lawyers, technical advisors um, together in one place. So it really is probably the preeminent conference that gets together to discuss what you have just mentioned, the problems that we encounter and hopefully the solutions that are needed to try and tackle what sometimes seems like a fairly insurmountable problem. So the, the negative part of the conference was that Many, many of the participants are still talking about the fact that the African continent has more than 700 million people that don't have access to energy on a daily basis. And while this number has been pretty constant for 20 years, it's a combination of while we're making great strides in some areas and in some regions in Africa, the population growth story means that the the numbers are remaining reasonably constant. The big theme of the conference is over the last five years, I guess, have been around energy transition. So very much every country on the continent has adopted a form of net zero commitment, a commitment to decarbonization and climate change. It's top of agenda, but the narrative has changed and shifted very much to a just energy transition, which means fundamentally that it's impossible for the continent to switch off coal, oil, gas, etc. overnight and just switch on, on green electrons through whether it's PV, wind, um, hydro, etc. The financial commitment, the amount of money that is needed to make that transition is virtually impossible. So a lot of time and energy is being spent on working out how to transition out of areas such as oil and gas fired power stations to green energy power stations. That was the one key theme I I think that did come out. And the second key theme is that across the continent, transmission is probably the most important factor constraining the ability to just switch from dirty electrons to clean electrons. Each country has significantly different problems. A country like um, Namibia, for example, while it's a, a very small country in terms of population size, it's a very vast country. And to try to get transmission up and down the country is is still a a significant challenge. So I think those were the two big key themes, but very much the transition is happening. People are talking about um, distributed generation moving away from centralized, massive power stations to many, many more smaller power stations where you are able to locate these in rural areas. And again, the more you do decentralized uh, generation, the more you're able to serve areas of the population that maybe are constrained because of things like uh, transmission lines. And which African region appears to be in the lead when it comes to the generation of green electrons and green molecules on the continent? In relative size and scale, it has to be South Africa. It's not always a popular thing because many of our neighbors further north believe that they're doing a very good job. But given the size of our total installed capacity, and the percentage of that that is actually green, I think we are doing a very good job alongside probably a country like Kenya, who's also doing an exceptionally good job. But um, the liberalization that has been happening in the South African market has led to the private sector, for example, procuring as much, if not more, green electrons um, or, or busy building those green electrons than, for example, that which Eskom has procured. So I think we are doing the best job, and I think we certainly are are moving very, very quickly in that space. And is enough being done to take up the many opportunities that mining offers to advance green electron generation and green molecule production in Africa? I think very much. I think most of the uh, mines that are owned by 
global mining houses have absolutely committed to net zero targets. And as a, as a result of those net zero targets, are trying very hard to procure green electrons. And there are probably three main drivers of that. Number one, a major mining group like Anglo America, Glencorp, et cetera, they have, they've got very, very serious net zero commitments, decarbonization commitments, and they are committed to meeting those. So they are, they are procuring a very hard. But over and above that, across a lot of the continent, you have a combination of the costs of things like diesel fired generators, diesel fired power compared to, for example, renewable energy in the, in the shape of photovoltaic um, or PV, so solar plus potentially batteries, the price points are now shifting quite dramatically. So there's an economic imperative to shift. Um, and then it's around security of supply as well. So the, those three factors, I think, have led most virtually every mining house in South Africa is in the process of procuring green electrons. And we're seeing that absolutely across the continent from the DRC, Central African Republic, Zambia, etc. We are certainly seeing a massive shift by the mining houses themselves. And what are Africa's strengths when it comes to transitioning to clean energy? Martin, so our, our strengths are very much we do have a good endowment of resources like the sun and the wind. Um, many of the African countries do have very good hydro capabilities. We, we have um, water in a lot of the regions where there are dams where we're able to tap some degree of, of hydroelectricity. But on the flip side, I think our constraints are still transmission. So in very many of the slightly more rural areas, the ability to do decentralized, small-scale PV, what you're doing is you are displacing diesel-fired um, generators, which are generally, apart from being very dirty, are are very expensive, and we are seeing massive shifts into mini and micro grids. These are developing to be able to give populations firstly access to power, and then secondly, as a consequence, access to green um, power. Then, what would befall Africa if it turns its back on the critical need to transition to clean electrons and molecules? It's a very contentious debate right now, but to put it into context, there there are not that many countries on the continent that actually do produce coal um, at scale and or oil or gas. So major countries, for example, um, Nigeria needs to transition. South Africa needs to transition because of the quantum of coal or, or oil or gas that we, we happen to currently produce. But certainly there is no question that it's becoming easier to raise money for renewable energy projects. Um, the multilateral um, agencies, the large development finance institutions, many, many are categorically shutting down any ability to finance coal, oil, and, and increasingly gas. So access to capital will be constrained if, if people do not shift. What I think um, where we're seeing some really excellent examples of a proper transition would be a country like Mozambique, where major projects have been developed, but on a transition pathway where um, a major uh, gas project was financed by a number of global development finance institutions, but it's on the basis that that is a transition pathway to ultimately renewable energy. So I think without making those commitments, countries will find it more expensive to raise capital or find out that that capital, um, many, many large scale power projects are financed with huge amounts of debt. Certainly the banks are being pressurized not to finance fossil fuels any longer. And by 2030 and thereafter, it's going to be very difficult to raise money for projects that are not green. And we have the Hive Green Ammonia Project at Kuka in the Eastern Cape. Was awareness of this heightened at the event at all? And so certainly the whole green hydrogen taxonomy is becoming far more important. Um, major projects are being showcased. So nowadays when there is a major power conference, green hydrogen per se becomes a very, very important part of that. All of the projects in South Africa, there, there are approximately 18 projects that have achieved, have achieved a certain status under our strategic investment um, portfolio. Um, most of them were showcased, but the Hive Green Ammonia Project is a major project that is being developed in the Eastern Cape. It's a 450 megawatt um, electrolyzer, a very, very large scale project, which will export ammonia into um, either the East or the West. So yes, it, it very much did get a lot of um, attention 
and around all of the components that are required to make it happen, such as port infrastructure, the transmission infrastructure, etc. And is enough emphasis being placed on the need to develop skills for the green transition? Martin, so um, you're aware of the work that the Energy Council in South Africa is doing. Um, so again, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more specifically to South Africa. The Energy Council has done fantastic work in promoting a collaboration with ESCOM to help sort out some of the critical skills that, that are becoming uh, problematic. And, and work has been done on um, unlocking grid transmission rules, etc. The single biggest issue that I'm going to say that, that we are sitting with at the moment is this lack of capacity. It's a lack of engineers, it's a lack of technicians, it's a lack of people at the levels of procuring on a big scale. Eskom's National Transmission Plan is a, a world-class plan, but my reservations are around the capacity to actually implement this. So it, it happens from, literally from the ministries down, the, the planning and policy teams that are, that are being engaged. Um, and certainly as we, we, we are talking about building trillions of rands worth of new transmission lines, the ability to integrate those transmission right lines, to get them into the right places at the right time to deliver electrons into areas, I, I, I think we have a critical skills shortage problem right now. We are still um, continuously hearing that our major international partners who have invested in the, in the country in, for example, the green electron production process or um, building green power plants, um, there are still massive issues relating to things like visas, ability to get visas for the people that are needed to come and work on these plants. So I think that should be a massive focus. On a better note, for example, there is work being done on developing a green hydrogen valley into the Eastern Cape, into the Cooker region, and uh, the Port Elizabeth University is playing a major role in working out how it's going to upskill and create the necessary engineering courses that are needed to transition into a green hydrogen world. And what steps are financial institutions, including Nedbank CRB, taking to help the continent to do the right thing environmentally? Um, Martin, again, I think most of the financial institutions have made their own net zero commitments. And we all have glide paths where we commit to ultimately shifting away entirely from fin financing heavy high carbon um, industries to zero carbon industries. So financial institutions play a massive role. Without that capital, these projects just don't go ahead. And we, we have some examples in South Africa where as a result of banks refusing to finance new coal-fired power stations, those projects did not go ahead. So there's a very, very important political lobby. And certainly it makes very, very good economic sense for us to be investing increasingly in green. Within the NetBank, we have a massive uh, commitment from our board to allow us to participate in green energy projects, and we are going full steam ahead. I mean, I, I certainly cannot remember a time when our pipeline of projects in the in the green energy space was as, as heavy as it is now. And finally, Mike, can protecting the environment be done competitively? Martin, so I, I, I believe absolutely it can. Right now, there is a little bit of a disconnect in that South Africa, for example, does not have a carbon tax in place yet. So we're not competing on, on a level playing ground. Um, people that are investing in renewable energy are doing so because the economics make sense. But when a carbon tax is imposed, the true economic consequences of not shifting and transitioning into something green is going to be felt. So most of our major industrial players, for example, their, their commitment to going net zero is because they realize the consequence of that. They realize that there is a double whammy. The cost of raising capital if you are not decarbonized and, and what will also double up the effect will be the consequence of a carbon tax that may be imposed. If Eskom and Sassel, for example, were hit with carbon taxes today, there would be fairly serious um, economic consequences. So I think it's an imperative and I think everybody has, has accepted and understood that the, the timelines and the pathways to that are, are now really the most critical things. That was Creamer Media's Engineering News and Mining Weekly, speaking to Mike Pio, the Head of Infrastructure, Energy and Telecommunications at Nedbank CIB.